This evening we're going to just look at one passage since this is a topical study. Um, we're going to be looking at several places in Scripture, but it's always good to, to anchor it in, in one place. And that's what we're going to do in this particular text in Luke 23. Our text is actually verse 43, what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. But we're going to read a bit of the context beginning in verse 32 of Luke 23. Speaking about, of course, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and who else was with him in that uh, particular event. In verse 32, we read, Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurtling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured. The veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. Again, I draw your attention to what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. He didn't say, today you will be with me in purgatory, or today you can't be with me in paradise because you have to pass through purgatory first because he was going to go directly to heaven. Now, that was not an isolated event. That's something that the Lord does for all who will put their trust in him. So let's take a little well, look at that this evening. Now, I've already mentioned to you that we're going to do perhaps a mini-series within a series focusing on what we believe as uh, over against what the Roman Church believes as we began to look at last uh, Lord's Day evening, as you'll recall. And as I've said, we're really returning to a series that we had begun a little while ago, um, the What We Believe series. It's always helpful to understand why we believe what we believe. That was one thing that um, I found was missing in the churches that, uh, that I attended earlier on, that Donna and I attended after we were married. It seems like they were telling us what to believe, but never why we should believe those things. They really weren't equipping us so that when we ran into Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, we knew we believed differently, but we really didn't understand why. So it's important that we not only know what we believe, but why we believe as over against what others believe, both in and out of the church. So since this is the time we think about the Reformation, I thought it would be good to continue this theme for a bit. Now remember, the Reformation took place because of several issues that uh, were in the church of that day, uh, issues that really all originated from particular teachings that the church had embraced over the years. And there were many such issues. As a matter of fact, we saw a few lists of those things, uh, such as the churches withholding God's word from the people, uh, the veneration of Mary and the saints, and the relics of the saints or remains of the saints, uh, the office of pope, the celibacy of the clergy, purgatory, transubstantiation, the necessity of the priesthood and the sacraments for salvation, indulgences, 
penance and absolution, justification by works, regeneration through baptism, pilgrimages, separation of the clergy and the laity, asceticism, monasticism, prayers for the dead. Boy, there's a lot, there's really a long list. Um, there's many others that we could talk about. And I'm not saying we're necessarily going to look at all of these things, but we do want to try to understand some of them. These were the things that both the forerunners of the Reformation and the Reformers themselves objected to because these things were adding to Scripture. These things contradicted Scripture, and that's a very dangerous thing to do because the Scripture contains for us the word of life. We need to understand what it says. We don't tell the Bible what it should say. We let the Bible speak for itself, and we need to listen to it, and we need to submit to it if we are to find the Lord. Now, that's one reason why we should spend some time perhaps hashing over issues that divided the church so many years ago. First of all, because we need to understand what the gospel is, what the Bible actually teaches. And we do need to be thankful that through these men that the Lord raised up at that time, these errors were exposed so that we might know the truth. Again, as we've said numerous times, as the Reformation has come around, humanly speaking, if the Reformation hadn't taken place, we might all be lost because the gospel may yet be hidden behind a system of works. But secondly, I think it's important for us to understand these things not only for our well-being but also for the well-being of others. That we might help others escape these errors because, believe it or not, these things still exist today in the Roman church. And perhaps if we understood these things a bit more clearly and knew how to answer them, we might be more useful in helping our neighbors who believe these things find salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now tonight, I thought we'd begin with that particular issue that sparked the Reformation. There are actually two of them, but this is uh, one of them, uh, the one that actually began it all, and that is the issue of indulgences. And really, it's tied together with several other of these things that I've already mentioned, and we're going to look at some of those things just briefly, but we do want to focus on indulgences. So let's begin by considering what an indulgence actually is and what it is that it's used for. Now, there's no better way to find out what the Roman Church believes regarding indulgences than to go to their official documents. And they have a, well, a very helpful document called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this particular quote appears in paragraph number 1471. So as you can, know, as you can see, this is a very lengthy catechism. This is what um, they write. An indulgence, and by the way, this is a bit technical. There's going to be a technical definition and then one's a bit simpler. An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church, which, as the minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints. An indulgence is partial or plenary, according as it removes either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin. Now, there's the technical definition, and we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit. But let me give you another definition I found on another website that, after quoting this, sort of summarizes or paraphrases it in modern language. This is what they write. Indulgences are basically credits for the church militant, us here on earth, and the church suffering, the poor souls in purgatory, from the spiritual storehouse that is the Catholic Church. Saints throughout history have offered up their sufferings, mortifications, alms, and good works as capital in the church's spiritual warehouse, and it is all there for our benefit. 
Now, the only thing missing from that second definition is the fact that Jesus' merits are also there as well in this treasury of merits stored up in heaven. So here's a couple of things to understand about indulgences, a couple of key points. First of all, indulgences do not forgive sins. As we read in this catechism, uh, it is, it's for another purpose. It's for those whose sins have already been forgiven. An indulgence, they say, is the remission or the removal of part or all of the temporal punishment. Not the eternal punishment, but temporal punishment due for your sins. Now, what do they mean by that? What they mean is this. Every time you sin, you become guilty. But you also become liable to punishment. Now, here's a couple of examples. One, one example is that of David. Remember that King David sinned with Bathsheba, committed adultery. And then to cover up the fact that she uh, conceived, he made sure that Uriah, her husband, was killed. In other words, the blood of Uriah was on his hands. Now, when David confessed his sin, his guilt was immediately forgiven. No consequences of hell for that, he's forgiven. However, there were other consequences that were punishments or temporal punishments in this world. One thing, the Lord took the life of the child that was conceived. There were also consequences on his household. Remember that one son of David violated one of his daughters, and then another son of David killed that son for that violation. And then that same son uh, t tried to take over the kingdom and have his father David put to death. The Lord said that the sword would not be removed from his house. There were consequences, punishments for that sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord forgave their guilt, but there were consequences. The Lord cursed the ground so that as Adam would toil, it would through, or he would through sweat, as it were, bring forth food from the earth. And instead of food, oftentimes there would be weeds, or at least weeds along with it, and I think we all know what that's like. There was also consequences for Eve that she would struggle with submission and that she would bring forth children in pain. So their guilt was forgiven, but there were consequences. And I think we would agree that there are consequences for sin. Now, the Roman church believes this, that if you do not satisfy those consequences or those uh, satisfy for those punishments, if you don't go through that punishment through such means as penance or giving of alms, or good works, or sufferings for righteousness sake, or the purchasing of indulgences, then you will have to satisfy for them through your sufferings in purgatory before you can get to heaven. Now what is purgatory? Well here's another definition, a very short one from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs number 1030 and 1031. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Now we'll look at that particular subject in a later sermon, but uh, we do need to understand that if you don't satisfy for the temporal punishments due to your sins, even though your guilt is forgiven, you have to spend time in purgatory in order to be purified of your sins, in order to become holy enough to enter into heaven. Now note as well that indulgences, and I hope you can remember this from the study on Luther, can be partial or plenary, which means they can remove part or all of this punishment. They can also be applied to the church militant, those who are alive, or the church suffering, which we personally do not believe, those who are dead who are in purgatory, but they cannot be applied to those who are in hell. 
Now, to whom, or I should say, who can apply these merits? Who can apply these indulgences? The Roman church alone can do this as they alone have the keys to the treasury that were entrusted to them because they alone are in succession to Peter. At least that's what they would say. And then what finally is uh, this treasure? Well, we've already seen what it is. The righteous acts of the saints, their sufferings, their mortifications, their alms, their good works, as well as those of Christ. Basically, they believe, and we'll have to look at this a little bit later as well, not tonight, that there are those who not only satisfy for their own temporal punishment, but there are those who go above and beyond. So they have more than they need in order to get to heaven, and those excess of merits go into the treasury. By the way, it does say the righteous acts of the saints. You and I are not saints. A saint is somebody who, according to the Roman church, goes directly to heaven and passes by purgatory because they had more than enough to get there. Again, the excess being placed in the treasury of merits along with those of Christ. Those are the, that is the treasure. Those are the merits that can be applied by the church as desired through indulgences. Now let's go back to what we looked at last week. What is it that Luther was actually objecting to? He objected to the idea that the Pope or the church had the power to remit these punishments due to their sins because if they did, what, what a, a base thing for the church to charge money for this, uh, to, to build a church when they could just simply open the doors of purgatory for the sake of charity alone. One of Luther's uh, 95 Theses, number 82, says, look, if this is the way it is, people are going to ask, why does not the Pope liberate everyone from purgatory for the sake of love, a most holy thing, and because of the supreme necessity of their souls? This would be morally the best of all reasons. Meanwhile, he redeems innumerable souls for money, a most perishable thing with which to build St. Peter's Church a very minor purpose. Now, you might think that after the Protestant Reformation that the Roman Church would have reformed her teaching on indulgences, but they didn't, and that can't happen because, as you know, within the Roman Catholic Church, they believe in the infallibility of church councils. And there was a church council that met after the Reformation. We call it the, uh, the Counter-Reformation. It's when the Roman Church became the Roman Church, when they codified their beliefs and said, this is what we believe, and if you don't believe this, then you're cursed. Well, this is what uh, another website says regarding this. It comes from the Catholic Answers website regarding indulgences in the Council of Trent. It says indulgences are part of the church's infallible teaching. This means that no Catholic is at liberty to disbelieve in them. The Council of Trent stated that it condemns with anathema those who say that indulgences are useless or that the church does not have the power to grant them. That comes from Trent Session 25, Decree on Indulgences. Trent's anathema places indulgences in the realm of infallib infallibly defined teaching. By the way, Rome believes that is true, not only for what the councils say, but also for what the Pope says in his office as the shepherd and teacher of the church. Whatever the Pope says in his office, touching morals or doctrine, is infallible in their thinking. So whatever the Pope says, whatever the councils say, all of that is infallible, and of course, it all has to agree, but we know that doesn't. Luther pointed out, it's clear as day that Popes have contradicted one another, and so have the councils. So how can we believe them to be infallible? Well, anyway, that's what an indulgence is. It's basically taking from the treasury of merits the church applies that to an individual living or dead to help that person make satisfaction for the temporal punishment due to them for their sins. 
Now that's what they believe. The question is, what do we believe? How should we respond to this? What does the Bible teach? Well, first of all, I think we can agree with Luther, can't we? That if temporal punishment is not removed by the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, that if there really is a purgatory where people would suffer for untold years before they can enter into heaven, and there really is a treasury of merits in heaven that the Pope can open at will to release any believer immediately, that he should do it out of love, not for money. I think that would give us pause right there. But we know that such a doctrine isn't true for, for many reasons. So let's ask some questions regarding this teaching. First of all, does the Bible say that purgatory is a real place? Do you find it anywhere in Scripture? Now, as I said before, we really don't have time tonight to examine why the Roman Church believes in its existence, but we should note that it doesn't occur anywhere in Scripture. Okay, that's, that's one thing. But secondly, is there any indication in Scripture that any believer has to receive additional purification after they die before they can enter into heaven. Now, I think one thing we can agree with the Roman church on is this, that you must be holy to enter into heaven. You must be righteous to enter there. But where we would disagree is in, in this, Jesus Christ provides that holiness that we need. He provides that righteousness purely through faith in his name. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man to whom, uh, excuse me, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. It's because of Christ's righteousness that we can enter directly into heaven. By the way, I just want to point out the fact that Luther really capitalized on this particular uh, verse of Scripture but to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. You see, the Roman church, as we will see a little bit more clearly later on, believes that for you and me to enter into heaven, we actually have to be righteous in and of ourselves. But you see here, God justifies the ungodly through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives to us what the reformers called an alien righteousness, a righteousness that doesn't belong to us. It's not one we have earned or even worked for by cooperating with God. It is the personal righteousness of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who did everything that was necessary to make us able to enter into heaven. He justifies the ungodly, not the godly. He makes us godly in Christ. So there is no need of further purification. We are personally, wholly, positionally, we would say, in the Lord Jesus Christ as soon as we believe. We are perfect and able to enter into heaven. Now, thirdly, what does the Bible say about those who actually do die? Where do they go when they die? Well, not only does the Bible not say that there's a purgatory, the Bible teaches that those who die in Christ go immediately to heaven into the presence of God. That's what we saw in our meditation. Paul writes, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. I don't think you could put it any more clearly than that. He tells us that when we die, when our soul leaves our body, we go directly to heaven. There is no intermediate place. And this was not something that happened or that Paul alone was expecting. He didn't say I, but he uses the word we because he was including in that all believers. 
particularly those at Corinth. We know from Scripture that this was Paul's personal hope that when he died, he would go to be with the Lord because we read in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, for, me to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Now, was Paul's uh, dilemma between uh, staying in the world in order to do fruitful labor for the Lord or to go to purgatory to be purified further? No, it was either to be in this world or to be with Christ. You know, the JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, believe in what's called soul sleep, the idea that when you die, your soul goes into suspended animation, waiting the day of the resurrection when you'll be judged and then enter into a paradise on earth. But if that's true, then what Paul says here makes no sense at all. Why would Paul want to die if he couldn't immediately be with his Lord? Why would he want to die if he was just going to be in soul sleep for uh, thousands of years before Jesus Christ came? He wouldn't want to do that. He would want to live on, that the Lord might use him further. But we see him here torn between living and dying because if he dies, he will be with the Lord. And that is very much better. So against the JWs and against Romanism, when you die, you go to be with the Lord. In our Lord's parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man died and he went straight to hell to a place of torment, but Lazarus was carried by the angels to heaven where he was comforted and there was no purgatory in between. On the day of judgment, the Lord is going to send the goats directly into the lake of fire. But will the Lord say to the sheep on that day, Come, blessed of my Father, enter into the purgatory prepared for you, that you might gain the holiness that you need to inherit the kingdom? No, that's not what the Lord says. He says, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, are we to assume that on that day the Lord is going to grant a plenary indulgence to all of his sheep when he wouldn't do it before? I don't think so. And what about the thief on the cross? You realize it, it's not in, in Luke's gospel, but in one of the other gospels when the two thieves are crucified with him, they're both hurtling abuse at the Lord, which means they were both unconverted when that crucifixion began, but sometime... Uh, from the time they were crucified until the account we read here, one of them actually was converted. And he looked to the Lord. Now that thief didn't have any time to make satisfaction for his sins before he died. And yet the Lord said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. He didn't go to purgatory. But he went to paradise, which is not a compartment in hell, as, as many broad evangelicals believe. But it's heaven. That's where Jesus went. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus' human soul went to be with his Father in heaven while his body was in the tomb for those three days. Now, should we assume that the Lord granted to the thief on the cross a plenary indulgence as well as those uh, on the day of judgment? Well, actually, we should assume that. The Lord did grant them a plenary indulgence, but he does that for everyone who trusts in the Lord, not just for specific individuals and not through the church. It comes directly from Christ. This is what the Lord says that he will do for you. If you trust in him, he will not only remove your guilt, but he will also remove any temporal punishments that you might have to pay or you might be liable to for your sins if you only look to him in faith. Now again, we do have to agree with the Roman church in this, that there are often consequences for sins in this life. I think you realize that's true, right? There are consequences when you do what's wrong. If you steal, you have a debt to pay back. Perhaps you have to do time in jail. If you murder, you may have to forfeit your life or spend time in prison. But the point is, consequences like these are only for this life. They don't follow you beyond this life. 
if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And why is that? It's because Jesus already suffered to satisfy any punishment that is due to you from God. As we saw this morning, he suffered at the hands of his people. He was handed over to the Romans for scourging and for crucifixion. He died on the cross and he bore God's full wrath for your sins. The Lord is not going to exact a double payment, one from Christ and one from you, because his good works and his sufferings and his enduring the Father's wrath on the cross was enough. It opens the doors of heaven for everyone who will trust in you so that when you die, or for everyone that trusts in him, so that when you die, you will immediately enter into heaven. Jesus said to his disciples, John 14, verses 2 through 6, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. By the way, when Jesus said this, I don't think he was talking about a second coming. When he says, I, I'm going to prepare a place for you, my disciples, uh, they've been with the Lord for quite some time and he still hasn't come yet, so they are with him. What was Jesus referring to? He says, hey, when you die, I prepared a place for heaven, in heaven for you. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may also be. That's something that the Lord does for all who trust in him. The only thing we need to do in order to be holy, in order to, to have a full satisfaction for our guilt and our temporal punishment is simply look to Jesus and receive this gift. That's what grace means, right? Grace means getting something you don't deserve. What is mercy? Not getting what you deserve. Well, we deserve punishment, eternal punishment, temporal punishment, but the Lord remits, removes, satisfies for all those things as a free gift. If you will simply trust the Lord and turn from your sins and follow him, if you do, then when you die, he will come and receive you to himself. Again, the Lord has already endured, we might say, the purgatory of this world and God's wrath so that you might enter into heaven if you simply trust him. So first of all, let's be thankful that there is full and complete remission of all guilt and all punishment through the work of Jesus Christ alone. We don't have to pass through purgatory to arrive in heaven when we die. All we have to do is trust him. And let's take the knowledge of these things also to those who are really being held captive by uh, the Roman church by the system of what we would perceive as works to show them that they might be freed from that and have that same hope that we have of entering into heaven without having to go through all the rituals and all the works and eventually through purgatory, which as we know isn't going to happen anyway. You have to trust the Lord. It's either heaven or hell. So let's pray that God will help us to help some find their way to Christ uh, through understanding these things a bit better. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's do give the Lord thanks for these mercies and uh, pray that he would make us more useful to him.